the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation. He was a vital Lands Illinois network architect. Sorry, there we go. From 2015 and to 2020, and is a member of the Chicago Wilderness Executive Council. If you look up conservation in Illinois in the dictionary, you're likely to see a picture of this next person. Fran Hardy, the Director of Terrestrial Conservation for the Nature Conservancy in Illinois, is a co-founder and past president of PSCC. He's done everything from helping with the first Illinois Natural Areas Inventory completed in 1978, to helping to establish Midaywin National Tallgrass Prairie, to helping to get millions of dollars from Midaywin, Kankakee Sands, Savannas, and for updating the INAI. He has helped write and pass the Illinois Prescribed Fire Act, and of course, the Natural Area Stewardship Act. Prior to the Nature Conservancy, Fran spent 25 years working for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources Division of Natural Heritage. Next up is my good friend and mentor, Brooke McDonald. Since 1996, Brooke has been the president and chief executive officer for the Conservation Foundation in Naperville. The year after he started there, TCF launched a series of campaigns throughout Northeast Illinois to promote the public acquisition of open space. To date, Brooke has organized 14 successful referenda campaigns that have raised more than $750 million and preserved more than 35,000 acres of land along the way. He has served on the boards of the Illinois Environmental Council, and the Campaign for Sensible Growth. Brooke also served two terms on the board for PSEC and served as its president for two years. Last, but certainly not least, is Bob McKeer. And I served with Bob on the Vital Lands Illinois Working Group for a number of years. Bob is the executive vice president at Open Lands and works with leadership, staff, and board to develop and advance impactful land conservation strategies. Bob's work involves policy, planning, land acquisition, and ecological restoration that take place at sites of all sizes, from a neighborhood park to a national wildlife refu refuge. Bob oversees a wide range of projects, including the acquisition and restoration of more than 1,000 acres of land in the Hackmatack National Wildlife Refuge, management of the Open Lands Lakeshore Preserve, and community-driven projects that provide public access to the lands and waters of the Calumet region. And these candidates are quite impressive in their own right. As we heard in Wednesday's presentation about the strategic direction for PSCC, this organization is on the precipice of change and great promise. Building capacity, managing increased membership, setting direction, these are all things that these four people do for breakfast every day. We would be very lucky to have them join the board and give of their expertise, their knowledge, and their enthusiasm. One of the ways that the culture of conservation in Illinois is changing, involves diversity, equity, and inclusion. PSCC's strategic plan from 2018 states the following. We acknowledge that Illinois is geographically and demographically diverse, and that we must be sensitive and responsive to that diversity. We are made more whole by fully reflecting and engaging the depth and breadth of the populations we serve. Everyone is entitled to experience the outdoors. Well, to state the obvious, these are all middle-aged middle white men here. But look closer and you'll see people who work with staffs that are majority women, 
people who have begun changing the culture in their own organizations to make them places where everyone is welcome, everyone is heard, and everyone who works there, as well as those in the communities they serve, feel a sense of belonging. I am certain that they will help move PSCC and the conservation community in Illinois toward inclusion, equity, and belonging. And we need to have a motion to approve Paul, Fran, Brooke, and Bob as new board members. Would someone raise their hand to make the motion and to second it? And maybe Jamie, Jamie, you can let me know who's doing what. I see Dave King. Thank you, Dave. And a second from Jim Herkert. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. Are there any questions or discussions at this time? Hearing none, Jamie, would you bring up the poll so that people can vote? All right. And then maybe, Jamie, you can let me know how things are going. All right, we've got 35 votes in. I'm hoping that most of them are yes? Yes. <laughs> OK. All right. So I see that. Here. There you go. Great. There we go. Fantastic. Well, I see that we have uh, approval for these new board members. Uh, thank you very much. And I welcome them to the board. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Okay, thanks, Dan. Let's see how we're doing on time. Great, we're right on time. Next up, we have the LTA report. Uh, and that's going to be Mary Kay O'Donnell and Elizabeth Ward. Uh, Mary Kay O'Donnell is the Senior Midwest Program Manager for the Land Trust Alliance and is responsible for land trust with organizational leadership development training, mentoring, and peer learning. Elizabeth Ward is the Vice President of Communications at the Land Trust Alliance. For assuming this role, she worked for 10 years at the Nature Conservancy. Other things, she was responsible for its flagship marketing channel, nature.org and Conservancy Magazine. In 20 years experience, print and interactive media, strong editorial background in book publishing. She is a graduate of uh, Wellesley College. So, Mary Kay and Elizabeth, welcome. Thanks so much, Ryan, and thank you all for allowing us to join your meeting today. Um, I am going to give a very brief update because I would like all, almost all of the time to go to Elizabeth so she can tell you um, about our relevancy campaign. There's a lot exciting happening. Um, the first thing I wanna mention is that we have made the decision that rally this year is going to be virtual. Um, the uh, the um, applications for presentations will be open through March 12th. So I hope that you will consider putting something in. Um, the rally will be held October 5th through the 7th. The other thing we wanna to touch on very briefly is just our advocacy efforts. Advocacy days um, will also be virtual April 19th through the 21st. I attended my first advocacy days last year and it was fantastic. The training um, and experience that you gain is is um, absolutely wonderful and can help you with local, regional, statewide, and federal advocacy. The other thing I want to mention is that um, I hope that you will consider becoming an advocacy ambassador. 15 of you in Illinois have made that pledge, um, and you can uh, look on our website for more information um, on that. Um, I want to touch briefly on the 
our priorities, our advocacy priorities for 2021. But first, we have to stop and celebrate the passage of the Great Americans Outdoors Act in 2020. It permanently reauthorized the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That was very exciting. Um, so our top priorities are always uh, centered around conservation funding. We're working on the Farm Bill, on rulemaking and implementation, um, and, and already thinking about reauthorization for 2023. We are working to increase federal funding um, for conservation, as well as um, making an attempt to see if we can expand federal programs for third-party holders, meaning land and in, in including land trusts. Another big policy area is, is tax issues. We have to put an end to the abuse of conservation easement tax shelters, um, and we are going to continue to work on that. We're also working internally with the IRS to help reform how they look at and evaluate um, conservation easement donations in particular um, to make sure that you know innocent, good-hearted people are not going to be disqualified for minor, minor mistakes. So we're working on that. We also do a lot of work with energy and climate. We're working on natural climate solutions, trying to drive funding to land trusts so that you can protect more resilient lands. We're also uh, working on advancing conservation compatible energy siting solutions. We're very excited, however, um, to be committed to the 30 by 30 initiative. When you get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, there are links. So you can go to our website. We have a page set up. You can link to President Biden's executive order, which he, um, which he recently signed, and also Andrew Bowman's blog on what 30 by 30 is and what the land trust community can do to help. We know that this goal of protecting 30% of our land and waters by 2030 cannot be accomplished without the help of the land trust community. Um, so stay tuned. There's going to be lots more and really exciting information on that as it comes forward. The last thing I want to touch on is the 21st Century Civilian Climate Corps. The reason why I want to highlight this is that um, this has come from all of you as Illinois leaders, led by Jerry Edelman, introducing the idea of a 21st Century Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, so President Biden signed in late January an executive order calling for a Civilian Climate Corps. This mirrors the renewed Conservation Corps Act that was developed by Senator Durbin and Representative Rush last year. So this is getting some legs under it, and it's very, very exciting. So at this point, I want to turn this over to Elizabeth Ward. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, and I'm really excited to let you know what's been happening with our marketing campaign. Um, we're calling it the Gaining Ground campaign at this point. Um, and essentially, you can go to the next slide, Mary Kay. Um, this is um, something that was part of our strategic plan, our most recent strategic plan, and it's a commitment to leverage all of the land trust um, relationships to connect more Americans to the land. It's a recognition that if we are going to have an impact on things like the 30 by 30 goal, that we are going to have to bring more support, more people to vote, to volunteer, and to donate to really be a catalyst for increasing our work. And so we're committed to finding and bringing those people to the table to support land trust work. Next slide. Um, so I'm gonna just talk through um, where we are. We're actually working on a pilot for the campaign right now. We have a marketing plan in place and I'll walk through that really quickly. We've also just completed, and when I say just, I mean, I just yesterday got the final report from, um, actually it's not even the final report, um, sort of top line results from the um, researchers. So you guys are sort of seeing it hot off the press and then I'll talk about where we're going from here. Next slide. Um, and you can go right to the next one. Um, so we are um, conducting a pilot for the campaign and we've engaged land trusts in 10 different markets. Um, you can see a list of them here. You'll see it includes open lands. So we do have Illinois representation. Our goal was to find a mix of land trusts that are that represent the diversity of the land trust community geographically in terms of their conservation priorities, in terms of the size of their organizations, um, et cetera. We think we have a really good mix. I know we have a really great group of land trusts here. 
And they have been fantastic partners as we've worked on um, developing the campaign. Next slide. So um, each one of the pilot land trusts has um, offered up a, one of their communications people to serve on a pilot land trust advisory council. We meet with this group roughly every two weeks and they have helped us to develop um, ideas for stories and content that we're gonna be featuring in the campaign. They've helped us to um, figure out all of the marketing channels and assets that we'll have at our um, um, fingertips for this. We've developed with them metrics of success. What's, what does success look like for the land trust? Um, we've, um, they've been really instrumental in the messaging, what messages we wanna use and how we can refine the creative um, concepts. Um, we're also gonna develop as part of this campaign, a toolkit for land trust so that when we roll it out, we can give land trust a toolkit that will create everything that they need to participate. Messages, um, any kind of art that they could use, social media content, all those types of things. So what goes into that toolkit? Um, they've been helping us think that through. Um, helping, um, they've been really helpful in developing the market research that I'm gonna walk through, the marketing plan. They were, um, work, work really closely with our marketing um, firm that we've hired for this, GMMB. Um, they're also really thinking through, what does this campaign look like at the local level? What are engagement opportunities that, they, that land trust can offer up for these new folks that are coming to the table? And they've been helping us to raise funds for the campaign. Next slide. And um, you can go right to the next one. So as I mentioned, we've worked with the pilot land trust to, and GMMB, our marketing partner, um, to develop the campaign. And uh, I just want to touch on a few components of this. The first one is we spent a lot of time thinking about the audience for this. And um, we're focusing on what we're calling the new power base. And this is an audience that we've identified through our research. And I'll talk you through that in a little bit. But we also recognize that the campaign has to be palatable for existing audiences, both at the national level and locally. And we know that that's different depending on where you are. We know that the campaign needs to reveal re appeal both to urban and rural communities um, and in the research that we've done, that's where we see the most distinction in what messages work at a high level. I'm happy to say the same message messages work overall, but there are some distinctions in that urban rural um, difference seems to be where that plays out. Um, we are all we're, we're going to do continue to test messages live once we get out there. Um, we've done great market research, but there's nothing like being out there real time to test it. That's the beauty of a digital campaign. Um, we're gonna start by making people aware, but ultimately the goal here is to move them to action. And we're gonna be um, doing a lot of outreach to these audiences to move them along that commitment, um, um, up that ladder of commitment and engagement. Next slide. So as I said, the theme for this is gaining ground. This is a very, very early example, just using stock photos. It's not the final language, but just to give you an idea of what this campaign may look like once we go live with it. Uh, next slide. Um, so in terms of land trust engagement, um, you know, the land trusts are, we are going to showcase land trust work and elevate the work that they do. We're gonna tell these impact stories about how they're, they're really impacting their community. Um, the idea is that we're going to use a lot of video. We're going to tell a lot of video stories. That's going to work in this digital environment. Um, and we're going to push out a lot of video ads. Um, and the, the land trust, the way that they're going to support the campaign is, as I mentioned, they're going to have local activities. But, so they're offering, you know, volunteer opportunities for people to engage. Um, we're hoping that they'll leverage the advertising locally that we'll be doing at the national level. We're hoping they'll use their social media channels to amplify the work of the campaign that they will use the branding of the campaign in their channels. Um, they'll help with the fundraising, as I mentioned, and that they'll also highlight campaign supporters. We're hoping that the primary engine for the funding of this campaign is going to be corporate sponsors, and um, they'll need, we'll need to recognize them in all of our national channels, and we're hoping that local land trusts will be able to do that as well. Next slide. So in terms of campaign tactics, um, we have a paid media plan um, and all of the creative assets that we're going to buy. Um, and this is the biggest, um, in terms of budget, this is the most significant part of the campaign. And just to give you an idea, um, so the Land Trust Alliance is gonna be pushing this campaign 24 seven, 365 days a year, but we're gonna do a big advertising push with the Land Trust for fairly short periods of time 
Um, if you, I've done, a, I've looked at a lot of different um, campaigns, along, cause campaigns along these lines, and you see this concentrated push over a fairly short period of time is what's most effective at really getting people to pay attention. People are getting hit by stuff all the time. And so if you're coming at them over that short period of time, they're more likely to, to actually sign up. So we're looking at sort of a six week big push media um, media buy for this um, in the 10 pilot markets for, for the initial rollout. Um, we'll have a campaign website. Um, we'll do social and email marketing. And then again, we'll have these toolkits for and provide assistance for land trust to participate. And of course, we'll have the, the corporate engagement. Next slide. Um, so market research. So um, two years ago, we did a national market study and the goal was to identify who, it's one thing to say everybody should be a part. Everybody should care about our issue. Everybody should take part. But realistically, you want to find those people who are most likely, who aren't supporting you yet, but who are most likely to do that. It's the low hanging fruit. And, and I did a lot of looking at the research that had been done on um conservation and attitudes towards conservation. And it's all good, right? Most research that you read, the majority of people are like, I love conservation, I love nature. And um, there was one study where 86% of people said that conservation evoked their strongest emotions. And yet those people talk the talk, they're not walking the, they're not walking the talk, right? They are, um, they, um, it's not an issue that um, is typically um, top of mind when they're making their decisions in terms of voting. Any kind of environmental issue um, tends to be down in the like 2% in terms of a, a real um, consideration when they're voting. Um, the average adult American spends less than five hours a week outside and they're totally fine with that. So people, and, and we know that the environment as a, as a um, category in giving usually ranks down um, sort of at the bottom of the list um, when you look at overall philanthropic giving. So how do we elevate this amongst people's priority? But more importantly, how do we find those people who aren't just going to talk the talk, but are actually prepared to take action? So we designed a marketing study to find people who are really prepared to act. And um, we set up a, a, set, a, a criteria, and then we went out to find how many people out there meet the criteria. And the criteria were, first of all, they had to say that they care. They had to say that they thought that um, conservation was really important. We had a number of questions to gauge that. They had to, so they had to check that box. The second thing, they had to already have taken some action. They had to have already donated and volunteered for any kind of environmental organization in the last two years. And then the third thing is that we had a list of 19 actions that you could take um, in terms of sort of um, connecting to conservation and actually acting on behalf of conservation. And those ranged from taking a walk on a local nature preserve, um, going to a farmer's market, all the way up through donating, voting for a bond initiative, making a decision on a candidate based on their views on conservation, um, all the way up to hosting a fundraiser on behalf of a conservation organization. In order to be considered a high prospect, they had to, they had to say that they were extremely or very likely to do 12 of those 19 things in the next two years. So these are not people who just say they love conservation. They actually have already taken action and they're prepared to take action in the future. And what we found is that roughly 13% of adult Americans, that's about 33 million people, fit into this category of what we call the high prospects. So that was really exciting news. Um, and we did some additional research to learn a little bit more about them. Where are they? Um, what do they look like? What's their demographics? What are their psychographics? What do they care about? And so now two years down the road, we're sort of ready to move forward with the campaign. We wanted to go out and do additional research. We wanted to learn more about them, but also two years have gone by. We wanted to validate that research that we did the world has changed a lot in the last two years. Are these people who prioritized conservation in their lives two years ago? Is it still a top priority? Um, we also wanted to look at any regional variations, if there are any. Um, we wanted to see if there had been any COVID impacts, um, as I said. We really wanted to test messages and our creative concepts to inform the development of, that, of those aspects of the campaign. And then the other thing that um, when we did the research two years ago, my big question was, here are all these people who say they love conservation, 
over 60% said that they were extremely or very likely to donate to a conservation organization in the next two years. An even higher percentage said that they were prepared to volunteer and yet they hadn't engaged with land trust. So what were the barriers? Why is it that those people haven't engaged yet? So um, that was the goals for this research. Um, so move, next slide. So we did a survey. It was um, an online survey. We had um, some open-ended question. It was done in the pilot land trust regions only. So we did it in the greater Chicago area, um, both for um, Open Lands, who's in the pilot, and also um, Shirley Hines, because um, their um, service area and some of their reach extends into Illinois. Um, and um, we did this um, in, we went out in the field on January 6th. Um, we deliberately delayed the research until well after the election because we didn't want to get caught up in all the craziness. And then we went out in the field on January 6th. So timing is everything. Um, we were out in the field through February 8th. Um, it was a long survey, 30 minutes. We made these people work really hard. And we ended up with 441 of these high prospects from across those 10 regions. Next slide. So what did we learn? Well, the first thing is that there is extremely strong interest, um, mostly who said they are extremely likely in learning more about local land trusts and in supporting them and in ways that involve little time. So things like petition and ballot support, not surprisingly. Um, and additionally, a large number of these pilot high prospects are very or extremely likely to get engaged if they're invited to share sto stories and voted, vote, photos and donate and volunteer. They are prepared to do that. Next slide. Um, we also found that there was exceptionally strong and intense support for this theme of gaining ground um, and its focus on permanent protection for future generations. That's something that came up again and again in the research that we did. People love that concept. Um, the idea of saving critical habitats for plants and animals was a primary motivator for why to support land trusts or land conservancies. Climate change also came up really high as did environmental equity. That was something this group cared about. Um, and then access for, to clean water and fresh air and natural areas. If you look at any environmental study, clean water is always at the top. That was not different here. That was one of the primary motivating things. Another thing that came up that I think is really good news for the land trust community is that when you layer on top of that, the idea of local and community, that actually strengthened all of, the, um, all of these terms. Next slide. So um, this is a little hard to read, sorry, um, I need my glasses. <laughs> um, so we asked them, um, here's a number of reasons for why you would support land trusts. And um, we wanted them to tell us which ones were most compelling. And as you can see, the top one at 88%, and just so you know, the researchers told us that anything over 30% is considered to be significant. And as you can see with these numbers, we are way over 30% here. Um, so land conserved by land trust is permanently protected, giving us the confidence it'll be there now and for future generations. Incredibly motivating for this audience. Um, the second thing is um, this equity idea. For too many communities, lack of access to clean water, air, and land is a chronic issue with land trusts promote environmental equity through projects like watershed protection, community gardens, and access to parks and natural lands. People really love that. The next two are related to climate change. Um, you know, land trusts play a role in absorbing polluting gases and keeping them out of the atmosphere. And um, land conserva conservation reduces the impacts of climate change, uh, reserving, um, safeguarding natural areas, plants and wildlife that we all cherish. This idea of community health is also something that came up really high. Um, next slide. Um, so we did, um, we also did something um, called a, a word equity-ish um, exercise. We literally gave them term, just words and phrases. And we said, all right, please um, let us know which ones of these really resonate. And as you can see, um, this top one is conserve land, protects habitats for plants and animals, protecting habitats, protect connection to nature, clean water, fresh air, and healthy food. These are all messages that land trusts have already been using. So this was great news that these kinds of messages resonate with these audiences. Um, we can move to the next slide. Um, and then we asked them about what actions they're likely to take. Um, and that dark blue bar is extremely likely. So 57% said they're likely to sign a petition to protect or conserve land in your area. And, and the very and extremely likely 86% of them 
Um, if you look about halfway down, a little more than halfway, you know, 78% that they are very or extremely likely to donate to support land conservation. 78% said that they're likely to volunteer to take part in land trust activities. Um, so these, again, highly engaged and they want to be asked to participate. They want to be making a difference in their communities. Um, so again, really good news. And it gives us a lot of sense of types of calls for action that we might wanna do in the campaign. Next slide. So another thing that we did is we had them look at images and get a sense of which ones were most likely to mo uh, motivate them, which one also can really um, conveyed the themes that were most attractive to them. So some of the ideas that I've walked through with you. And as you can see, the images that really show pristine nature that has access for people. So those top two images, which were the two top performing images, um, it's a little hard to see in the slide, for which I apologize. But you know, the one on the left, there's actually some people hiking along the trail there. And the one on the right, you don't see any people, but there is a clear trail going through the woods there. Those were the, the images that were most, um, that people most responded to. Um, and again, I think this is good news for um, land trusts. You know, these are not images that um, are um, unlike a lot of the beautiful pictures of the outdoors that land trusts have. They also really liked images that showed people working together. Um, in this case, it's, it's you know two women cultivating this garden. That was something that was appealing. What was not appealing, and again, this is not entirely surprising, but it's always good to validate it. Um, you know, is this um, idea of the negative consequences of not acting. You know, we have to tell them that story, but they don't necessarily want to see it. They don't need to. They already get it. They're prepared to take action and they want to know that what they do is going to make a difference, make the world look better, make the world, all of those things. So not using any kinds of these images that show negative consequences of climate change or other or, or development or other things along those lines. Next slide. So what are our next campaign, uh, next steps for the campaign? So we need to raise $1.8 million to fully launch the pilot. The bulk of that is um, to cover the costs, well, it's to develop the website and do all of that other work. The bulk of that is actually for the media buy. Um, then um, we, and we're, we're working with the Pilot Land Trust to do regional fundraising. Um, we've also hired dedicated staff at the Alliance to really help with the corporate fundraising for this. Um, and they, um, we have two new people. They just started um, at the end of January, beginning of February. They have put the ground running. They're awesome. Um, and then um, we're also um, working to um, pull in um, creative assets and stories that we can tell to pitch to all of these different funders. And then we're continuing to work with the Pilot Land Trust to finalize the story selection and all of the assets, the photos, and all of that that we're going to tell in the campaign to work on the toolkit. Um, and again, to work with us on the fundraising support. So I know I went that, through that rapid fire. <laughs> um, Mary Kay and I are both are very fast talkers, I noticed. Um, so anyway, welcome questions for me or Mary Kay. Thank you, Mary Kay and Elizabeth. A lot of information there. Uh, so folks, if you have questions, get them in the chat. I have a couple that we can start off with. Going back to the um, polling information, Demographically, where did the 13%, this 13% of highly engaged individuals occur? Are they primarily in certain regions? Do you see greater percentages in urban versus rural areas? Do certain parts of the country have higher rates? Uh, really interested in drilling down on the breakout of that 13%. Yep. So um, I don't have that information for the study that we just did, um, other than to tell you that the researchers told me last night, because I was literally on the phone with them last night saying, can you please give me anything on this? And he said, what he could tell me is there are pretty significant regional differences. What we found in the research that we did two years ago is um, that this audience, um, in terms of demographics, they skew, um, first of all, they do skew urban, suburban. Um, they also are um, much likely, um, most likely to be millennials and Gen X. So that's um, roughly sort of 26 up to um, below the baby boomers there. So early 50s. Um, so which is great news for us. Um, it's a highly diverse group in terms of race and ethnicity. Um, really large uh, percentage are Latinx in this group. Um, they tended to be, um, not surprisingly, given their ages, they are married with kids in the home, they are um, relatively high income, 
And at least two years ago, they were uh, employed um, and they are fairly well educated as well. So it's actually a very attractive um, audience. We, um, again, I don't have, um, it, it was fairly standard across the country when we did the research two years ago. We couldn't get a whole lot of regional variation. I'm actually, um, just to get at that question, I'm talking to researchers of doing another quick um, omnibus study, which means we'll just add a couple questions onto a, a national questionnaire just to get at the demographic and the regional distribution of those nationally. This, the, again, the research we just did was just regionally um, in the pilot areas. So um, I hope to have more information on that soon. So I hope okay. that's a question. Um, in addition to building the co with some corporate partners, what about non-traditional partners, uh, black indigenous people of color, or even far other end of your chart, the people uncomfortable with nature? Do you, how do you plan to address that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So yes, I am um, right now, to be honest, very much focused on the um, fundraising for this campaign, which is why I, I emphasize the corporate piece of it. But our vision for this campaign all along is that we would bring other nonprofit partners in from other sectors. And that could include a whole mix of things. Um, certainly bringing in um, you know, the, the BIPOC groups, et cetera, but also health. You know, if we could bring in, um, you know, nonprofit health organizations who could help us to emphasize the health benefits of conservation and amplify and reach their audience through that, that's just one example of exactly the type of thing that we would love to do with this campaign. So, yes, that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, I am not seeing any more questions, and we are at 9.45, so I'm going to wrap this session up. I really appreciate Elizabeth and Mary Kay. Uh, updating uh, us on these exciting initiatives. And uh, we have your contact information if anybody wants to follow up. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. I One of the things I neglected to say as I was introducing Elizabeth is you all are the ones that are hearing this for the first time. So very special day. Uh, Elizabeth has not presented this um, information to anybody else. So um, Thanks, thanks again for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, I'm gonna hand it over to Carrie to introduce our next presenter. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for that great presentation, Mary Kay and um, Elizabeth. Really appreciate your work on all of this for all of us. Um, and now I'd like to uh, introduce Mary Alice Holly from the Conservation Trust for North Carolina. And um, I was really taken a few years ago um, when I attended a, a rally event and started to see how um, incredibly diverse that the rallies have started to become. And I Thought, I started thinking about our organization and how we can overcome some of the struggles and barriers that we had. So I took a look at the webpage for the Conservation Trust for North Carolina, and I was so blown away by what they have been doing process-wise. Um, and so I, I contacted Mary, Mary Alice Holly, and she agreed to speak to us today. And she currently serves as the Director of Community Innovation, and she liaises with the CTNC staff board and community partners mm -hmm. to advance their mission to build resilient, just communities for all North Carolinians. During her time with CTNC, Mary Alice led the nationally recognized My North Carolina Moment mm -hmm. communications campaign designed to help land trusts better engage with millennials and black indigenous people of color across North America, excuse me, North Carolina. So Mary Alice now specializes in supporting other land trusts in their effort to better communicate these issues related to climate resilience and racial equity in conservation. In her spare time, Mary Alice is deeply committed to conservation in all of its forms by building a homestead in Car Caraboro, North Carolina, 
with her partner, two spaniels, 11 chickens, four beehives. She also explores North Carolina's public lands and waterways from her trusty kayak. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, uh, invite Mary Alice to give her presentation. Thank you, Carrie. Well, wonderful. You guys have my presentation up. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I really appreciate uh, Carrie reaching out and for you guys inviting me here today. Um, I've given lots of presentations over the years to land trusts, um, and I think this is the first that we'll be talking specifically about our journey around um, racial equity and inclusion. So next slide, please. So a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, my home land trust was Lookout Mountain Land Conservancy, um, managed by Robin Carlton, who some of you might know from Raleigh. Um, outdoor recreation and land conservation has been deeply rooted in my core since as long as I can remember. So joining CTNC just felt like a really natural fit to be able to help conserve our natural lands, the parkway in North Carolina, and connect with community partners. Um, and I love how Carrie said that coming to Rally uh, has been a change over the last few years. That it's become more diverse. Um, because at Rally a few years ago, that was really my aha moment with all of this work. I was hired by CTNC to manage a statewide community communications campaign um, directed to bring more people of color into the conservation space. And going to rally, I think, was really impactful for me because it was the first time that I felt truly involved and included. I was surrounded by 2,000 other land trust professionals like I'd never been before. And I just felt like these are my people. I felt so good. And then I was talking to a colleague of color who was at the same conference. And I was telling her just how happy and excited and energized I was. And she said, wow, my experience is completely different than yours. I am a black woman and I feel like I've never been in a space that was um, more different than what I'm used to. More white people, more conservation people. I don't feel like this is my community. And so I really took a step back and thought, what is it that I personally can do? What is it that my organization can do to where at next year's rally, at future rallies, the land trust community becomes a place where everybody feels as included as I do, no matter their race, their gender, their age, or their kind of connection to conservation. Next slide, please. So uh, CTNC has a really outstanding and diverse history. We were, um, we were founded as an incubator for land trusts uh, in the early 90s, and we did that. We founded or supported the growth of up to 24 land trusts across the state of North Carolina. And as uh, a board member said, the babies grew up and it was ready to kick them out of the nest. And those land trusts became so strong and influential on their own we really had to get to a point to decide what did our mission need to be and what challenges for North Carolina did we need to solve? And it gave us a really great opportunity to start looking at other projects and programming um, around diversity, equity, um, youth programs. And so that was kind of how this all started for us. Next slide, please. So in 2008, um, we started awarding many grants to land trusts as part of our incubator support to land trusts across the state of North Carolina as a state association, um, specifically funding diversity efforts. Also in 2008, we started identifying that, um, that we needed to create pathways to leadership for land trusts. And so we started the MAX internship program to support rising leaders of color with paid internships with land trusts across the state. In 2011, we established a diversity and equity board committee. Um, in 2016, we completed a diversity to equity assessment with a consultant open source. Um, we launched the communications campaign that was incredibly successful, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
And then in 2019, we went through a full strategic plan revisioning. How are we going to take ourselves from this traditional land trust model to what we thought really needed to be um, holistic of all of our programs, but also how we could really meet the needs of North Carolinians across the state. And so what I wanna say with this slide is, this journey for CTNC absolutely did not happen overnight and your journey is not going to happen overnight either. So what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this presentation is really understanding how your organization can kind of start from the beginning to make it real. Next slide, please. And so this graphic, it's got a lot of words on it. I'm gonna share this graphic with you after this presentation. Um, but this is something that we've created. Uh, it came from a one pager. It came from somebody asking me about how did CTNC do it? Why does your website look so good? Why it is, uh, your, how are your programs successful in applying racial equity and diversity principles? And this is really it. And so I know that we wanna talk about programs today, but we also need to really envision what an entire organizational approach to diversity and equity can look like. And it really takes breaking it down. So you, you focus on your executive leadership and board. You talk about how to um, manage your HR and hiring policies. What are your communication strategies going to look like? How are you gonna diversify your staff and leadership? How are you gonna keep this commitment going for the long term? So um, this is just a little bit of the way we like to kind of think of these as pathways that we get from one section to another. Next slide, please. So the Find Your Moment campaign, um, this was done in coordination with land trusts all over the state. And this was pre-strategic planning for us. So what I loved about this process was we really took one program and one campaign to really test out what we were going to do with this whole diversity and equity thing in the 2017, 2018, we've just come off a really contentious election. We know that we're at a place as an organization where we want to take this work to the next level. We're not sure of the readiness of our staff and board. We're not sure of the readiness of our community. It's where a lot of you guys are now, kind of post 2020 with this cultural awakening we've had. And so this really gave us the opportunity to test our messages, to really focus on shooting some new photography, building some relationships, and, figure, and giving our donors and supporters kind of a introduction to where we wanted to take the organization, but doing it kind of at a surface level approach, if you will, with communications. The biggest aha moment we had from this communications campaign, as you uh, heard me say earlier, the original goal of the campaign was to bring more millennials and people of color into the conservation community. And through our, and through our campaign development, we really stopped, took a step back and said, is that the right approach? And ultimately we decided, how can conservation community become a place that is more welcoming and supportive of millennials and people of color? Because if we change our organizations, then ultimately we are gonna bring those people in and we're gonna, we're gonna make a better movement for everyone. Next slide, please. So we took a lot of what we learned through um, that campaign. We learned that millennials and people of color overwhelmingly respond um, positively to climate change. Um, they feel equity, diversity, and inclusion is an express commitment that needs to be made by organizations that they choose to support. And that community-driven conservation would be a great way to apply those principles of climate and equity across North Carolina in ways that are really personally meaningful to those people we're trying to bring into the organization. So through a year long planning process, we made the switch. Um, we like to say that we moved beyond bucks and acres. I know that's a term we've all heard that we conserve land and we raise money to buy more land, right? And so we really wanted to turn that on its head and figure out what is what do the next 20 years, 25 years look like for CTNC? And we decided on to conserve land to inspire and enable people to build resilient, just communities. What's important about that is we're still conserving land. That is still at the core of what we do. But we really wanted to identify how people and communities could really be integral to how we're conserving land and how effective we are in meeting that mission. And 
and all we are prioritizing strong communities, equity, diversity, inclusion, and also uh, climate resilience. Next slide, please. And so we also look for the sweet spot. And so this is how we prioritize putting an equity lens over our programs is where are we working and how are we working where these projects and programs that we are delivering are um, addressing climate change and climate issues. They're strengthening communities and they're also advancing the ideals of diversity and equity within the conservation sector. Next slide, please. And so again, this is a lot of information, but this is also available on our website. We, through our strategic vision and rebranding, um, made a public commitment to race equity. So what we've done here is um, we're acknowledging our role, we're holding ourselves accountable, we're confronting the history of racialized land loss and displacement. And so these commitments were co-written with our board and um, diversity and equity committee, approved by the board and are public on our website. But the important thing is, this is not just on our website. This is something that we come back and hold ourselves accountable to every day, every week. Next slide, please. We also, um, as a staff, came together and decided what were the values of our organization. We want to be a values-driven organization that is authentic, bold, open. We are collaborating with communities. We are compassionate to our partners. We are inclusive of everybody who wants to have a part in conservation. And again, values are not just something that are listed on our website. We start every board meeting with a values activity. And so that can be anything from having a dialogue, reading an article, watching a video. We bring in guest speakers. So it's really this organizational commitment from the very beginning that we are constantly going to be accountable to the commitments we've made and come back and remind ourselves over and over again why we made those commitments and how that's being applied throughout the organization programmatically with leadership, et cetera. Next slide, please. And so we talked about that, um, where's that synergy? Where's that sweet spot of climate, community, and equity? For us, one of the first places where we are delivering this program is in Princeville, North Carolina. So the history of Princeville is this was the first town established by freed Blacks after emancipation in North Carolina. Um, named after Turner Prince, it is located on the Tar River. This is one of the most prime examples of environmental racism that we have found in North Carolina. The Tar River on one side is Tarboro, North Carolina, and it is predominantly white. It is higher elevation and protected from flooding at the river. Princeville is the low-lying swampland that gets flooded over and over and over again. And the reason why this community of people were allowed to settle there was because it was land that nobody wanted. This town has been flooded off the map multiple times throughout the last hundred years, um, most notably in 1999 after Hurricane Floyd and 2016 after Hurricane Matthew. Today, about 800 people still live there. Most of the homes are abandoned. Um, we are really working with the town to figure out what does a resilient future look like? So something for me, which is a personal commitment is we really want to help Princeville rise above this story of environmental racism and flooding. We're trying to give, we're trying to help them develop a vibrant future. So we have developed relationships with the town and that was not easily done. So we started building relationships just by showing up to community meetings about two, three years ago and um, have worked with the council of governments, the town manager, the city council, and just to build trust. That trust has come a long way to this point forward. We just last year were awarded a um, national fish and wildlife grant for $200,000, which we've matched with another 200,000. So we're bringing about half a million dollars into the town to start developing on the ground flood resilience projects. We are doing this in partnership with NC State, 
The NC State Coastal Dynamics Design Lab has worked with the town and looked at FEMA maps and floodplain and floodplain models and identified all of the parcels in the community and figured out how can we use these in a better way where conservation can provide protection from future floods so that this town can continue to exist. This town can continue to celebrate their rich cultural heritage and history, but in also in ways where when they do flood again, because this is climate change, this is uh, an intercoastal town in North Carolina. So what are we going to do about it? So we are working with them to identify um, parcels that can be acquired and um, reconserved as floodplains. We are working on identifying parcels that can be established as small scale agriculture and farming. Um, we, one of our AmeriCorps members has actually helped with um, reestablishing a local farmer's market. And we're also working with the town of Princeville and the elementary school. So the elementary school was flooded in 2016 and completely rebuilt. It was reopened in January of 2020 and then unfortunately had to close in March due to COVID. But they are back open and they do have students back on campus. And so what CTNC is doing is working with NC State. We're working with Conservation Corps North Carolina, um, which is a trail building organization. And we're also working with um, AmeriCorps. So we are going to be designing flood retention projects on the school grounds um, that will capture the rainwater, capture the stormwater, and keep it from kind of destroying the land around the building. But then also it's going to double as an outdoor education space. There are going to be uh, an AmeriCorps member place that is going to help the teachers develop an environmental ed curriculum and inspire the teachers to bring their classroom outside onto the grounds and outside onto a trail that will connect the elementary school to the rest of the neighboring community. And this is gonna be a multi-year project that starts this summer with funding from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, as well as other grant opportunities that we're applying for now. What's been really crucial about that and kind of going back to this idea of racial, racial equity is that the town identified these needs. They said, we've got a school that's just been rebuilt. We have children who feel completely displaced from their community and we don't have a lot of curriculum. We don't have a lot of programs that really give them this aspect of being a kid that we want them to have. Is there anything that conservation can do to address some of those needs? And we said, absolutely. There are lots of things and let's put our heads together and let's do them. And so because it's been a collaborative process and a community driven process, the amount of excitement from the town, the amount of excitement from CTNC and our leadership and partners has just been overwhelming and we're getting a lot done. Next slide, please. And so this is just one snapshot of what we call the floodprint. So this was designed by NC State's Coastal Dynamics Design Lab. This is a 45 page document that lays out a vision for the town um, based in land use and watershed management and stormwater management. So it addresses everything from farmland and ag to floodplain restoration to um, the project that we are talking about at the elementary school. And so basically over the next 10 years, this gives us a roadmap and it gives the town a roadmap. So they can be applying for federal and state funding. They can be apply we can be applying for grants and we have a roadmap for how collaboratively we can all work together to identify where conservation can be the solution that really revitalizes this town in a way that's resilient to climate change and flooding. And in a way that uh, lifts up the historical significance of the town. Next slide, please. So this is a question I hear a lot is, so CTNC has been doing this a very long time. What challenges have you encountered and what are we going to encounter? Well, I'll tell you uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> Board attrition is absolutely going to happen. And that, that's okay. So I think there are gonna be people within your organization that just either question the need for racial equity and conservation 
or they're just not quite ready to take that step. And so your organization really has to make the decision about where you stand on these issues and how you're going to move forward. Pushback from donors is also likely, but today versus years ago, it's not as bad as you think it's going to be. Um, for CTNC, we still have a lot of our historical conservation partnerships and projects. We've had people that have said, the equity work is just not something we want to support. Obviously, that's not what we want to hear. We want, we want to hear that everybody wants to support every aspect of our mission, but we also have ways for them to support the organization where they feel like they are funding a specific land deal, or they also might decide to part ways, and that's okay too. Um, board and staff are going to be at different places and paces. So something we've implemented is um, we overhauled our hiring and onboarding policies so that every person who enters into the organization or a relationship with CTNC understands from day one that part of being connected with CTNC means that you are making a personal commitment to race equity and inclusion in conservation. We have a training program that every staff and board member goes through where um, we all start at the same place. We go through racial equity training, um, the two-day REI training through um, the Racial Equity Institute. We also have a kind of document of shared reading. It includes articles from thought leaders, a book list, things that I'm sure a lot of people on this call have gone through. We've also created a shared language document. So that way, when you come to your first board meeting, you don't feel left out. You know what verbiage we're using. When we say BIPOC, you know that means Black, Indigenous, People of Color. Um, we, we really define the terms race, racism, equity. We also do... We partnered some years ago, this was before my time, with local consultants to develop a history of racialized land loss in North Carolina. It specifically focused on the issues of um, Black farmers and land loss that Black farmers have experienced. It talked about the um, racialized history of our park systems here in North Carolina. And so we feel like that has been an influential tool in helping people understand how to answer that question of, why race, why equity, why conservation? For us, those two, racial equity and conservation are hugely intertwined in everything we do and the entire history of North Carolina, as well as our organization. And so we make that very clear from the beginning that here are our values, here are our belief system, here are our commitments, and we hope that you can share with us. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be at different places and paces, um, and it's a constant struggle we have, but we're doing our best right now. We, br we bring in speakers, we bring in consultants to help us have courageous conversations to try to figure out how we can be moving in step with one another. Uh, also, authenticity is a big one. I think for a lot of predominantly white organizations, um, you should be prepared for your authenticity to be questioned. I've heard even recently, why land trust? Why now? If you've not done this work 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 400 years ago, why did it take 2020 for you to wake up? To that, I'll say that, yes, that's a very valid question. But for right now, for land trust, they are waking up and they are embracing their role in this work. And what an amazing, powerful group of people to be embracing this work. We have connections with wealthy funders, with wealthy landowners. We have connections with local, state, and federal government. Our power can really be used to make some transformational change within white communities, within BIPOC communities, especially if we can be embracing this idea of inclusion through our projects, programmings, our mission, et cetera. And also, how do we make authentic partnerships? How do we navigate that? And so I think for us with Princeville's particularly, um, what was important was going really slow, um, identifying where the need was. So we really didn't go in and say, hey, we're here. Let us do this thing. Let us build this garden. We sat, we listened, we waited to be invited in. And we said, 
we have money, we have resources, we have time, we have intentionality, and we want to know what it is that you need. And they told us what they needed and we figured out how to get it done. And we figured out how to put a conservation lens and a conservation solution toward the challenges that they themselves are trying to address. Next slide, please. And so funding opportunities. I think we talked about on the last slide, you absolutely need to be prepared that not 100% of your organization might be able or willing to come along with you on this journey. But the really exciting thing is that the landscape of funding and fundraising is changing rapidly. So uh, we got a fantastic grant from the NIFWIF. We've seen um, state funding, federal funding, NRCS, Watershed Protection Program. We have seen all sorts of funding models really start to embrace the idea of racial equity, really start to embrace the idea of collaboration and partnerships. And so what we say to partner organizations who are looking at doing this work is you are going to find so many more opportunities and doors open to you if you authentically embrace racial equity in your conservation mission, rather than if you try to say, no, that's not for us, and we're just going to build these kind of walls up against it. Next slide, please. And so something I've also heard, especially last year, is after George Floyd, after the protests, after the Black Lives Matter movement really made a resurgence, I've got this sense of urgency. I made a statement. I did Blackout Tuesday. What do we do now? Okay, so we read that book. We did that thing. What do we do now? And I think it's absolutely normal for you to be feeling a sense of urgency. And it's also completely normal for you to say, we're going to slow down and we're going to figure out how to do this the right way. So next slide, please. This is why I come back to there is a path and there are steps you can take, and it absolutely needs to be an entire organizational approach. Um, like I said, we did our communications campaign in 2017 and 2018, and it was hugely beneficial, but I remember saying to our organization, I don't feel comfortable putting out a communications campaign that reflects this organization that is young, youthful, racially diverse, if we ourselves are not ready to live that vision that we see on our screens. And so we really stopped and said, what can we do as an organization to deepen our commitment to this work, to educate our board, to educate our staff, really look at our work plans, and our projects and programming to make sure that we are embodying that idea that we are reflecting through our communications and messaging. And this graph gives you a really good checklist of places to start. And so we do have a diversity and equity committee. We do have a racially diverse board makeup of leadership. But we also have this whole body commitment of every member of our staff. So every board committee has racial equity commitments and um, goals in our work plan that we um, are trying to fit, trying to hold ourselves accountable to. It's the Blue Ridge Parkway Land Protection Committee has a whole communities approach that they are working on. Our community engagement committee has racial equity kind of goals and priorities that we're working on. So it's really important not to shoulder the burden on your people of color, your colleagues of color, or your diversity and equity committee. It really has to be everyone figuring out what their role in this is and can be. And also remembering just how many opportunities are going to be open to you once you figure out how to start applying some of this work. Next slide, please. And so I'm open to answering some questions today. I'm also open to continuing the conversation um, as we move forward, because like I said in the beginning, I want to see Rally be a place where everybody feels as excited and energized as I do when they walk in that room. And the only way that we are going to get to that point is if we as a land trust community really support each other and really kind of hold each other accountable to walking down this path together. So thank, thank you, you. Mary Alice. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things that I do talk to Mary Alice about uh, and also Steve Barg is uh, 
inviting uh, CTNC to do two or three uh, webinars for the PSCC, uh, delving deeper into some of these aspects that um, Mary Alice was talking about, particularly maybe some of the challenges um, and some of the processes to assist Illinois Conservation Land Trust with going deeper. Um, so Ryan, I'm gonna kind of hand it over to you if there's any questions. Thanks, Carrie. There was quite a bit of activity in the chat. A lot of kudos. Uh, I agree. Uh, that, that was amazing, Mary Alice. Thank you. Um, some folks are asking about copies um, of the presentations, and we will be working on getting uh, uh, those copies up on our website uh, after the conference is over. So those will be downloadable. And I know I am going to be watching the recording of this one. Uh, again, uh, so the videos will be available as well. There was a question, did you hire, Mary Alice, did you hire an outside consultant to do a diversity and inclusion assessment or was that completely internal? Yes, that assessment was done in 2016 before I arrived, but it was done with open source. Okay. Um, but I would add, especially that was 2016, especially today, there are incredible DEI practitioners and consultants all over the country. Um, and I, so what I think is always beneficial is finding somebody in your local region or community that really understands the complex challenges of what you specifically are dealing with. Um, so we try to keep our consultant list as local to North Carolina as possible. Um, that's not always the case, but I think for you guys, where you are, um, finding folks to really partner with would be beneficial. One of those partners that uh, Illinois Conservation Land Trust would be looking at is, for example, who did you guys work with that compiled the history of land loss and how that relates? Um, we worked with an organization um, called DR Works. Okay. And let's see, very active chat. Can you discuss any role that the Army Corps, FEMA, I know you mentioned NIFWIF, what about um, USDA, NRCS? Do, are there any other opportunities within those programs that you've been able to implement? Yes. So we, um, I believe it was last year, we're working with NRCS to identify if um, federal funding could come in to help with some of the floodplain acquisitions. Um, at this point, that has not moved forward. I think a lot of the challenge there, and this goes back to racial equity and programmatic work, um, there's a tremendous amount of heirs property, family owned land in um, Princeville and surrounding areas. And so that makes a tremendous challenge to clear title to work with FEMA to do these buyouts, right? And so North Carolina is one of those states who still has not adopted the Uniform Partition Act for heirs property. It was just recently adopted in um, Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia. We are gonna be introducing legislation this long session in North Carolina to hopefully get some legislation adopted so that it's much easier for these families to clear title because once they'd be able to, they would be able to gain access to USDA, FEMA, and other um, federal resources for, the, for their land. Thank you. I think that is it for the questions that I'm seeing. A lot of complicated yeah. in there, so please take a look. Um, if anybody has anything else, we do have a little bit more time before our scheduled break at 10.30, so feel free to just jump on in at this point if you have any more questions. I would like to kind of add that um, at the last, uh, I think, was it Pittsburgh, I think, at the last LTA rally, um, there were a couple of women there who did a workshop. Uh, I think one was a Native American woman and the other one was a Black woman who did a half-day workshop in the history of land loss. Um, I don't know if you know them, Mary Alice, or if that was part of 
what you've kind of been working on, but it was so incredibly powerful. We all sat around in a circle um, and we all had these cards that we put up, we would put up um, throughout time. And the history of, I would call it basically land theft um, was so powerfully done through that process because we got to look at not just like local things that were happening, uh, but governmental um, mm -hmm. policies. And even if there wasn't a policy, how a lot of the local governmental organization people who were in a position to give these farmers, for example, money, uh, wouldn't, uh, even when they applied and businesses were lost. So the history of land for conservation land trusts. I, I got to this place in the workshop where I felt like we were uh, still kind of um, participating in, in this process. Um, and it was very disturbing for me. So I even began to question whether I should be in this um, world of conservation of land. Um, and uh, what I learned from that workshop was that what Mary Alice was talking about today is that once we start creating these authentic partnerships, we can actually be a force for good rather than just be part of the problem. Uh, so that has been, um, that was a really big aha moment for me. And that's why um, I, I think it's important for us as Conservation Land Trust in Illinois to also start having these conversations at this level, which is why I wanted Mary Alice and others to begin to put forward some trainings in Illinois to see how we can move beyond feeling guilty or um, all of those things into being a, a positive force. Mary Alice, do you have a couple of comments on that in the last couple minutes? Um, I, I think that you summed it up beautifully that it is so important to remember the role that we all play um, as kind of land brokers. We have an expertise that a lot of folks don't have. Um, and so I liken it to my part, our partnership with the Blue Ridge Parkway National Park Service. I was at a meeting where I said, okay, so how quickly can we get this project done? They said, oh, Mary Alice, uh, our work plans are on a five-year basis where yours are on a one-year basis. So that's why we work with you. That's why we utilize your expertise and lack of red tape as a private organization, because you can do things that we can't. How powerful if we put that same principle to racial equity and community partnerships, looking at the assets that land trusts have, and then finding these authentic partnerships with local communities who don't, who have very different assets. And how can we really work together to address those problems and bring forward a need? Um, I see a comment here that said, were the city councils interested in the conservation aspect of what the land trust could offer or just the dollars? And um, I think it's both, maybe a chicken and the egg. Um, I think at first they didn't know what a land trust was. They didn't think about conservation and how it could be a solution, um, but they did know they had a relationship with NC State and they wanted that flood print document. And so we raised the money to fund the flood print process. And so in doing so, we built the trust with that community by raising money for something they needed and also starting to build that understanding of how conservation could really benefit their um, community needs. And it's just snowballed from there. So now we all have this document and we get to work from it. And every year we say, what's the next phase of this document that we want to execute and who do we need to go ask for money to do it? And so that's it's, it's driving our program work plan. It's been really a fantastic asset. That's great. I just want to jump in really quick um, and say, Carrie, uh, thank you so much. And Mary Alice, thank you so much. Um, this is the reason we have to stay the entire morning, everyone. Um, at 1145, we're going to have Brooke Hecht from the Center of Human and Nature. And I'm so excited for Karina Gould. She's a tribal spokeswoman for the Socorite Land Trust. 
and um, talking about um, recovering the native uh, the bond with our land. So I think this is going to be perfect kind of bookend. So thank you. Well, thank you guys. The, the agenda looks fantastic, and it looks like you guys have been so intentional about how to set up speakers to really kind of do the overview, but also the nitty gritty programmatic. So I'm, I'm excited for what you guys are going to come out of this week with. Thank you, Mary Alice. And you're certainly invited to stay on to listen to that session as well. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Mary Alice. That was incredible. So let's go ahead and uh, take our 15 minute break. And then when we get back at uh, 1045, uh, we'll have a little bit of an overview from Jamie on going into the various breakout rooms for the two sessions of planning tools. Okay. And we'll be here uh, if you need anything. Thank you.
stunning panorama of life. This is what drew most of us to conservation in the first place. But as the world has become ever more connected and complex, we've come to realize that conservation is still about saving these animals and these places. It's also about us and our ability to ensure our own survival. The Nature Conservancy has an extraordinary legacy of protecting land and water at an enormous scale. But today, we realize that we can't protect nature just one place at a time. We have to work at multiple places around the globe to make a profound difference so that both people and nature thrive. By 2050, global population is expected to grow to more than 9 billion people. The growing needs for food, water, and energy will tax our natural world as never before. At the same time, we face the threats of climate change, major biodiversity loss, and water scarcity. A new kind of conservation is needed. We're using science to set our priorities, but really a whole new set of science that we haven't used before. We're having to look at economics, agronomy, and hydrology to help us see the whole scope of the challenges that we face and make sure we're doing the most effective, important things. We believe that we can harness the awesome power of nature and renew our thriving planet. We are focusing on the things that will have the greatest impact on our world. We're still committed to protecting land and water. We'll continue to protect critical ecosystems, especially ones that won't be protected unless we step up and do it. We're still in that business. We're also now in the business of addressing climate change, feeding the world sustainably, and bringing nature to cities. That's the TNC game plan for the big challenges ahead. For this spectacular planet and all the life it holds, the clock is ticking. Only by working together can we give people hope Keep our wildlife wild. Keep our home whole. And ensure the future of a world that sustains us all.
opens up the rooms. Uh, we'll do our first half an hour session. Uh, so your choice will be landscape, the database management, uh, health insurance options, or Northwestern Illinois Regional Conservation Planning. Then we'll quickly regroup after that and select our session two choices. Thanks everybody. All right, give me just one second here. My options didn't save. There we go. And before I introduce Karina, I wanted to say a few words about the Center for Humans and Nature and why we at the center are engaging in this panel and this topic. So for those of you who are not familiar with the work of the center, the central question that guides our publishing and our other work is what are our responsibilities to each other, our fellow humans, and what are our responsibilities to the rest of nature, the land and water and air and our fellow living beings. Um, we are deepening our exploration of this question now, now that as of August 2020, the center has gone through this legal process of land ownership. Um, but for the center, we hope that this new chapter will be less about ownership and more about exploring what it means to belong to the land, to listen to the land, and more deeply understand what our responsibilities are to this place, which is uh, within the Liberty Prairie Reserve in Libertyville, which are the territories of the Kickapoo, Miami, Peoria, Potawatomi, and Ocheti Shakowin. As part of this work, um, we at the center put ourselves on trial last fall. So not in court exactly, but as part of the center's questions for resilient future program. 
One of the center's editorial fellows, Julian Brave Noisecat, curated eight written pieces on the question, how can we live respectfully with the land and with one another? And we agreed that he would um, conduct this work as a tribunal, calling a panel of eight expert witnesses to examine capitalist and colonial relationships to land and one another, and to inform the Center for Humans and Nature's relationship to the land where it now has an, a home. Um, as Julian writes, the testimonies endeavor to understand what has gone awry in our human societies, as well as to inquire what other forms of knowledge, values, and interrelation might form the basis of a more just and reciprocal relationship between land and people. So I want to invite all of you to read these testimonies. There are writers like Tommy Orange and Rebecca Solnit, indigenous scholars like Megan Bang and Melissa K. Nelson. It's a series of inspiring written pieces, spoken word and art, and you can find it at our website, humansandnature.org slash land. So as part of the center's journey at our new home in Libertyville, um, last fall, I was listening to the uh, wonderful podcast For the Wild, which is hosted by Ayanna Young. And I heard Karina Gould speak so powerfully about her work in Ohlone territory. Um, the podcast was entitled Settler Responsibility and Reciprocity, if you wanna check it out. And I, I was just deeply moved by what she shared. And so much of what she said was incredibly relevant to the current work of the Center for Humans and Nature. So when uh, Susan Lentz invited me to explore this topic of listening to the land and exploring our sacred bond with the land, I immediately thought of Karina and wondered if she would consider joining us. Um, fortunately, she and I share a close colleague, uh, Toby McLeod, who is the director of the Sacred Lands Film Project. I think he's on the Zoom with us as well. And Toby kindly agreed to connect me with Karina. But one important thing I wanna let you know is that um, just now, just a few minutes ago, is the first time that I have met Karina. So our conversation is going to be a moment for public learning for the Center for Humans and Nature. So I'm bringing questions to this conversation that the center is carrying on this topic. Um, and I hope that some of these questions will also be of interest to the other organizations represented here. So first, I just wanna say thank you, Karina, for giving all of us this opportunity to learn together from this beautiful work that you're doing in California and beyond. So to introduce all of you to Karina's work, I want to share that she is the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lishan and Ohlone. She was born and raised in Oakland, California, which is Huchin territory. She's an activist that has worked on preserving and protecting the ancient burial sites of her ancestors in the Bay Area for decades. She's the co-founder and a lead organizer for Indian People Organizing for Change, a small native grassroots organization, as well as the co-founder of the Segorite Land Trust, which is an urban indigenous women's community organization working to return land to indigenous stewardship in San Francisco's East Bay. So again, Karina, welcome and thank you. Are you, there you are. Okay, good. Good morning. Um, yes. So thank you so much for being with us. And I've um, offered this background um, about your work, but is there anything further by way of introduction you would like to share with us? Well, I like to introduce myself in our traditional language, the traditional language of our people in the East Bay is Chochenyo and my great grandfather Jose Guzman was one of the last speakers of the language and our language is coming back from being asleep for a couple of generations. My daughter, uh, Deja Gould is the language carrier for our tribe. And um, it's been quite a, a journey to get here. And I'm so thankful to be brought to this conversation with you, Brooke, and to meet you and to talk to other people that are caring for the land. And 
um, really we as, uh, uh, as our, our people uh, survived in the Bay Area, these waves of genocide and colonization, it's really been this, this, uh, this lifetime in my lifetime that we've been able to talk about it and try to figure out how do we put the pieces back together. And a land trust actually is a great tool to do that. Um, it actually puts us back in touch with our own lands. And uh, so I think I'm going to tell a story about that. Is that what you want to, want to start with? Yes, I, I would love, the question I would love to ask you um, I, is about this territory that's been returned back to you, this quarter acre. I would love to hear the story of how this happened. Um, but before you do this, I wonder if it's possible in some way to introduce us to Ohlone territory, if it's possible. I know it's from afar and we're on these screens, but one thing I deeply remember um, from the podcast with Ayanna Young is how you spoke of this land of abundance and these songs of abundance and this beautiful land where you are. So before telling us how you received this territory back, I'd love to have a picture of that land and what it means to you. Thank you. I, you know, I don't know if people know or where people are coming from today. Um, and I always say that you know, no matter where you are in this country, you're on indigenous land. And so it's important for us to talk about whose land, who was there first, what was their story, what were their names, what was the language of, of people um, that were there. And it's important for us to figure that out. Um, it's a, it was a respectful way of, of being on the land. And as we're talking here, I'm trying to find just a little tiny map of some place, but I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> uh, uh, so my ancestors lived in the East Bay and we are a tribe made up of the five um, tribes that were taken into Mission San Jose as part of colonization process. And when my ancestors, uh, so my ancestors who have lived here for the, uh, thousands of years had a relationship with the land on which we live. And it took a long time for us to have this relationship. But indigenous people, um, no matter where you are, have a, have a connection to the land and the way that they're supposed to be on the land. My ancestors were no different. Our mountain is Mount Tuyush, it's uh, Tuyushtak in our territory. Now it's called Mount Diablo. And our waterway is Lashan, and that's who our tribe is named after, the Lashan people. And our people built um, village sites that were along the bay where fresh water met salt water. And our songs and um, we're always about an abundance here in the Bay Area. And, and we look at the Bay Area today and we're all going through this, this devastating change in time. But more so now we see things that I never saw when I was growing up. There are thousands of people living without homes, living on the street. You know, there are more and more people that are hungry. And 200 years ago in the Bay Area, there was no such thing. There was no concept of hunger or homelessness here. Every creek, and we had many creeks in the Bay Area, every creek 200 years ago you could drink fresh water out of. And salmon and trout came up those creeks that led to rivers. Um, and so there was this abundance here. When the Spaniards uh, came and wrote in their diaries about this place, they, they said that the the land was taken care of in such a way that it rivaled those uh, parks that were in Europe at the time, and that it was so clean and taken care of, so well taken care of. Our ancestors at one time um, was running from Spanish soldiers and they, they, they uh, lost our, our ancestors, but they came to this place called the Carquina Strait. And at that time there was a salmon run and um, there's, the Spanish soldiers wrote in their diary that there was so many, there were so many silverback salmons in this, um, this Carquina Strait that they could practically walk on their backs to the other side. We've lost those salmon. We've lost two runs of salmon so far. We're in the midst of maybe losing another. 
and it's only been in a very short time that this has happened. But, you know, I think of the abundance of the Bay Area, of what has been here and what still is here, if we imagine ourselves in an abundant place where we can take care of everything and everyone that's here, that to this abundance that my ancestors prayed about and sang about for thousands of years is still right here. And we just need to reach out and touch it, that we have what we need um, and that's necessary for us to take care of this world. Um, and so this abundant place of filled with tule elk and salmon coming up streams and huge uh, fields of wildflowers and oak trees and um, that had everything that we needed. And it was uh, a beautiful place to be connected to and still is. So thank you so much for that. And that vision of um, beauty that is um, both past and I believe uh, future as well, as you say. Um, and in this process of land being taken, which of course is still going on, there is one small piece now that has been returned. It's only a quarter acre. Um, and what you've been able to do with this is extraordinary. And I'm hoping you can share that story of how this quarter acre was returned to you and you know what you see for the future as this just being the first in a long step and in a long journey, first step. Yeah, the, the land trust um, came into being um, uh, over decades of work, right? It wasn't something that happened um, because we just decided, oh, we want to have a land trust. It came with a whole different reason. Why did, why did the land trust come to be to begin with? And um, it came to be because in the Bay Area, my ancestors um, have been here for thousands of years, but there was in a an amazing history in California that most people in California don't know about, even though they may have grown up here. There's an amazing history of what happened to California Native people that most people don't know of anywhere in the country. And it was because we were trying to save and protect the West Berkeley, I mean, the, the shell mounds in the Bay Area. These are our burial sites, um, the places where our ancestors were laid to rest for thousands of years, for um, prior to any contact with anybody, our ancestors built villages and these shell mounds along the bay. They're a part of our, our cosmology and tells us how we're supposed to be human beings on this land. And um, the Spanish missions came and devastated that, that part of our culture um, through Christianization. And they uh, stopped our languages and our ceremonies. And then Mexico came and took over the land when they um, broke off from Spain and huge ranchos were given to people. So huge swaths of our, our traditional territory were given to people. And after that period, there was a period um, when um, America won the American and Mexican War. And then there was laws that were created in California that made it illegal to be Indian. And people um, spent, you know, the government and the state of California spent uh, $1.7 million hunting down native people. Now these are the things that people aren't told about that led us to the land trust, really. We, nobody knew what shell mounds were over 20 years ago and everybody assumed that Ohlone people were dead because we're taught about in fourth grade and never talked about again. So we're erased continuously in our own territory. But my friend Janella LaRose and I started standing up for these shell mounds during the dot-com era, what I call the dot-com era. It's when this way, when the internet was created. Why we're able to see each other today um, is because of this invention of this internet. Uh, but it also caused mass gen uh, gentrification in the Bay Area. People were being out bid for their homes and their apartments and people moved out. And there was development happening. And many of the ant my ancestral rem uh, remains along the Bay Area were being disrupted and destroyed because of its development. And in 2011, 10 years ago, this April, we took over a sacred site that had two shell mounds on the Carquina Strait where fresh water met salt water. But it was after that four hundred and uh, that four and a half month 
takeover of land that we were able to, um, the first cultural easement in the country was created between a park district, a city, and two federally recognized tribes. Now, Ohlone people are not federally recognized, um, but these two tribes came in. And what that means is that they actually paid the city to be partners on this land, this 15 acres of open space along the Carquina Strait that happens to be named Segorite, one of the last village sites of my ancestors. Um, and so um, by that, they were able to save the land uh, for us to use forever. Well, this is the first land that was returned to us in 250 years. We're in Oakland and you can see the freeway in the background and this beautiful organic uh, nursery here. And where this circle of people are is the first land, piece of land that was returned to us. You see Gavin um, Rader and his wife, Hale, um, they went to Standing Rock. And when people were standing up to, against the pipeline going through their traditional territories and their waters, um, Hale and, and, and Gavin went there and they were so moved by what happened there that when they came back, when they, before they left, they asked the elders what they should do when they come home. And the elders told them they should work with the First Nation peoples on whose land they're on. And they took that to heart. They were working with an Athabascan woman from Alaska who we have known for about 40 years. And she was working for them as an educator. And she told them about what we were trying to do, create a land trust. And so we sat under this California walnut tree and we had that discussion and Hale and Gavin told us that story. You see there, that's not just any organic farm or nursery here. They actually work with formerly incarcerated men and women coming out of prison. They do trainings while they're inside and when they come out, they have a job that can sustain them here. And so they said, we have this quarter acre of land that we have not started to use and we would like to return it to you. And Janella LaRose and I sat there and we looked at each other and we were quite shocked really. Um, in all the years we've been doing work, the invisibility of our people, um, we said yes. Um, and it was a miracle, I believe. You see this water here that's culverted is Lashon, who we are named after. And this freeway back here is actually on fill where the bay would have met this waterway that my ancestors had been on. And so this land is probably a village site that my ancestors had lived on for thousands of years. And this land is a half mile walk from my home. And it is in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Oakland. It is, uh, but it's a beautiful site. And we said, yes, but there was um, a contingency. We said we would pay Janella's salary to be there for a year because we'd had no relationship with these people. We just met them. And how weird would it be to walk across the land that they were taking care of and be here without a relationship with them? And so we agreed. And Janella began the work of cleaning up this because it had transmissions on it and people that take care of land, they know that it doesn't come pristine a lot of times, especially in urban areas. So we're cleaning this up and creating hoogles and creating relationships with the people that work there and building trust and doing those kind of work. We started to change and transform this land um, using people's hands, um, hundreds of people that came and supported us when this land was first returned to us. We had a fire in the center there and we walked. And Janella LaRose, the co-founder of the organization came up with this idea, we need to create an arbor, a place where we have not had in our territory in 250 years, a place where we could dance and bring back language and song and ceremony, a place for us to uh, do this work um, without having outside interference. The idea of rematriation to be able to have connection to our lands in the way that we originally were supposed to without the outside interference of anyone else. You see, most of my land, our traditional territory 
over 140,000 acres of it is owned by East Bay Regional Parks. And we have to ask permission to go onto our own lands, into our own ceremonial places to do ceremony. This gives us a sovereignty, a way of raising our children with a connection to those lands again. So we asked, uh, we tried to get the logs to build this arbor. 17 feet high, some of these logs needed to be, and nobody had one, any. Finally, a friend of a friend had a piece of land in Sonoma County and said that, they, that we could go in and thin out and take what we needed. And so 10 of us went up there um, and took those trees by asking the trees permission, by, um, by praying at each of these trees to give their lives so that we could recreate a ceremonial place for our children and our children's children. And we thought that we took these logs down and they were like 700 pounds each by the time we pulled them down in redwood logs, these redwood logs, and thought we would put them up in a, a month. And they sat for a year teaching us all kinds of lessons, um, waiting for people to come and help. And we asked people to come and help, to help us to clear the land, to take care of those logs, to take care or to reimagine uh, what this land could be together. And, um, and we ha we've had hundreds of volunteers from all walks of life that have come and have laid their hands on these logs, have cleared this land with us, have, ate with, have eaten with us, have sing, uh, sang songs with us, have done all of this stuff, young people. And we got a place while we were waiting, we got a container and we built out that container and we named it Hameka. And Hameka is everything together all in one place. Because we know that this is in a very poor neighborhood, there needed to be a place, a touchstone. As indigenous people, it's our responsibility to take care of the guests on our land, but we can't be good hosts without good guests. And so Hameka was created as a way for people to, a place to come. And we all know that there are places in our, in our societies where their folks will not come to be, uh, <clears throat> those people will be left and not saved um, during human made or natural made disasters. They will be the last neighborhoods to go to. And so Hameka was created to, to fill in that gap in this neighborhood too. So we created this container that has food and has fresh water tanks and has a rain catchment system and has uh, first aid kits. And we are building a outdoor kitchen on there right now. And this is the poles going up for that ceremonial uh, arbor. And this is the women's pole that's going up. And as the poles were put up, they were traditionally put up one for men and one for women, one for elders and one for children and one for the two spirit people who rock and do a lot of work for us. <clears throat> it was Janelle and I uh, being uh, for, foreman. <laughs> Our language is coming back on the land. Um, we're letting the land hear the language again. We're letting people that live in our territory hear the, land, uh, the language again. And imagine in the Bay Area, there are probably over 70 different languages from around the world that are spoken here in the Bay Area. Such an abundance and richness of language and not one of them is Chochenyo. We are, these are some of the medicines that we're growing on the land now and we are um, harvesting them. We are using them to make medicines. We are re-engaging with the traditional work of create, uh, working with Thule with our elders and our youth. And we are finally home again. Um, and so this is the quarter acre of land that I walk into and I still cry because those ancestors wow. um, remembered our relationship and we begin to remember our relationship with this land. Karina, thank you so much. Um, for sharing this beauty and the vulnerability of this story and journey. I'm, I'm speechless. I have a whole list of questions. <laughs> I don't even know which ones to ask. It's so beautiful. I think um, when I see that, 
when I see what you've shown, I see um, a vision for what could happen here also, that you're showing us a dream that can be dreamed in other places and in other ways um, by other people. And uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I almost wonder, so there are just two minutes. Um, there are three things I'm thinking about. Cultural easement is a new word for me. Mm. And so understanding the specifics of that, rematriation is a new word for me. I'm attracted to all these words, by the way. Mm -hmm. They, yes. they stand out and I say, oh, cultural easement, tell me about that. Rematriation, tell me about that. And then the other thing I will share is that here in Illinois, um, we are also living in the land of mound builders. We are in a landscape of burial mounds. We are in a landscape of ceremonial mounds. And I know there are people in the session here who are deeply engaged in that work and know the history. But again, for those of us who are not thinking about again, how we dream ahead and weave together um, our responsibilities to the ancestors of this place, to these mounds, um, to creating Hemetka and connection. How just, if there's any more, maybe you can say even technically about the land, the uh, cultural easement piece. I leave it to you. And then I want to, then we can open to the rest of the uh, group who I'm sure have many questions. Yeah, and so I just want to say, you know, um, I'm really thankful. Thank you for letting me tell my story. Thank you for, you know, let everyone coming in with good hearts and good minds and um, to listen to the stories and how they touch us. Um, and I always say that it's not me that's telling these stories. It's my ancestors, and I'm just a vehicle for them to do this work. Um, cultural easements, the first time we heard about it was when we were at the takeover of Segurite 10 years ago on the Carquina Strait. And we, um, we saw the document that was laid out before us because, because these two federally recognized tribes came in and had a conversation with the city and the park district and said, we would like to protect this. And how do we figure out a vehicle in which to protect this as an uh, indigenous people? And so that's how they created this, this easement. This easement allows the that there's three entities. There's the tribes, there is the park district, who is a separate legal entity, and there's the city. And, um, and so they sat down and created this, this cultural easement. It's a cultural easement because there are shell mounds there, because it's a ceremonial site, because it's, it's been all of those things in the past. The tribes had to pay the city money to, uh, to be park owners. That's what this cultural easement did. The way they did it is this, they were able to create a cultural easement by, it was $30,000, which was not a lot of money for, um, to buy into 15 acres of land. But the tr nobody can change the landscape of that land without the other two entities approval. And by creating it in that kind of a way, they save the land from being destroyed any further um, because they have a veto power. Right. So each each of them have a veto power, which is good. So that's how that cultural easement works. Um, I have not because they created that cultural easement on that land was really what gave us the push to do our own land trust. We realized that we had taken over that land for 109 days. And had we had our own land trust, we could have created that cultural easement ourselves with the city and park district. And so it really gave us the, the, um, the push to do the work in a different kind of way. We just had no idea that a, a land trust was a tool that we could use. It wasn't until I was in after the occupation of the land, the reoccupation of that village site, what, um, that I got invited to a meeting in Southern California. Beth Rose Middleton, who is a professor at UC Davis, wrote her book, Trust in the Land, about Native Land Trust. And she invited me to a meeting of Native Land Trust. And I had no idea why I was going there or really what a land trust was about. Um, and I met all of these na uh, Native folks that were buying back their own land um, or 
leasing their own land, but it was a way of re-engaging people in the land. And as I listened to their stories, it was always about re-engagement and all, uh, and some, some land trusts we know put up fences and no trespassing sign trying to save and protect our precious resources um, rather than opening it up and re-engaging people. And I think that's really what it was about, re-engaging people on their land that they had, their ancestors had been on for thousands of years, re-engagement of language, of ceremony, of song, all of those things are important. So a cultural easement onto places like that um, allows for tribes to go onto their land to, to take care of their original teachings. And we believe that whichever land we're on, we had a certain uh, list of instructions that we had to follow um, in order to keep that land healthy and thereby keeping us healthy and everything else that was there. And so I think cultural easements can look different for each place. We haven't, we were supposed to get an easement on that first piece of land, right? That uh, half quarter acre of land. Um, and Planting Justice does not own that land yet. And so they would have, it's a change on the title of the land that stays there forever, like an easement, any other kind of an easement, right? Um, but it allows the tribes to go and do cultural work on that. So that's the difference, I believe. Thank you for that. It sounds like a very powerful tool. And again, for me, I've, I'm just learning. This is the Center for Humans and Nature and for me learning, and I'm so grateful to do it with you. Um, Susan, are there uh, questions from the group that others would like to ask? If anyone has questions, you can put it in, in chat. I see a lot of um, wonderful, uh, wonderful story. Karina, thanks for telling it to us. Wonderful, inspiring story. Just fabulous. Um, really, truly inspiring. And Brooke, for sharing your passion. Really appreciate it. Um, if anyone else has any, um, we can put your hands up or just unmute yourselves, please, at this time. We do have time. Um, we have about 10 minutes right now. Um, if you want to just unmute yourselves. Hi, uh, this is Jerry Edelman. I'm wondering if uh, Jim Johansson, I see um, that uh, Joe Davis uh, Conservation Foundation did a, this first conservation easement last year that allows for access by indigenous people. Maybe Jim, would you like to share a little bit? Sounds like it's very similar in, in many ways to the uh, cultural easement that Karina was talking about. Can't hear you, Jim. Can't hear you. Well, how about now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think many of you have heard about, you know, the work that we've been doing with the, uh, uh, mostly the Ho-Chunk Nation over the last several years, but also our more recent work with the Ponca and the Meskwaki and um, several other tribes whose ancestors uh, lived in this area. And uh, this particular piece of land um, uh, is overlooking the Mississippi River. It has a series of uh, mounds built during the late woodland period. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was um, enable those mounds and these sites to be visited um, by the people um, whose ancestors built them. So what we did is we wrote into the conservation easement, and again, this is an agreement between JDCF and the landowner, um, and the landowner is a white guy. So the tribes technically aren't you know, party to this agreement, but what we wrote in there was a right of access uh, for the indigenous peoples um, if they wanted to come and visit this uh, property for uh, ceremonial or visitation or other cultural purposes um, that's that's specifically called out as a right within the easement. And we don't know if we did it according to best practices. We tried to borrow some sample language <clears throat> that we um, got from a, a different land trust, um, but we're, we hope to do it again. So um, we're, we're definitely interested in learning, <clears throat> excuse me, what the best practices are in making sure that um, we're, we're, we're staying, staying current with the national standards. 
Thank you, Jim. Anyone else? Okay, I have a question here. I live along the Fox River in Lake County, Illinois. I know we have many mounds here. Advise on how to connect with the local indigenous people. That's, uh, that's a great answer. I'm mean, a great question. Um, it's always, sometimes when we um, are living someplace, it's, it seems like it's difficult to find the indigenous people that have have always been there. I think that um, the first place I would look is just to Google search and see if there's uh, tribes in that area that have a website and to try to connect with them to, to have conversations. I often tell people when I'm doing my work, it's, it's good to uh, try to work with the indigenous people and don't be shocked if they're a little wary about um, coming to your events. And um, to continue to keep trying, I know, to keep inviting people, but not only invite them to your events, but to show up to their events and to start to build a relationship. Our relationships have been fractured um, over generations of time. And so it's, um, it's a job to create relationships. It's a job to, to create trust again, which is kind of why that, that relationship with the, us and planting justice was a, so important because it doesn't feel good to feel like an outsider on your own land. And it, but it's also important to build those relationships so that everybody feels comfortable. And so um, it, it may feel uncomfortable at the very beginning of building relationships, but it's well worth it so that our children's children don't have to do it again, that we continue those relationships um, in different kinds of ways and that we bring up our children knowing each other. Um, and that land together and how to move forward to make the best decisions possible. And um, so I, I don't know who the folks are, but I think that that's, that's probably what I would do. Wonderful, just so many kudos in the chat. Karina, I don't know if you're seeing all this, your passion and honesty is so inspiring. Um, another one that's really neat. What a wonderful, inspiring story. I was born in the Oakland area and really appreciate learning about this forgotten history and hearing about the dream that is moving ahead. Thank you so much for sharing. Wonderful. Thank you. A uh, question from Toby, what is the caretaker responsibility a land trust would have for a burial mound? You kind of understand the question. What is the caretaker responsibility? Well, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I can offer just from um, a legal perspective, I can't really speak obviously for the tribes. Um, if you do have a burial mound, just know that um, under Illinois law, all mounds are considered uh, grave markers, whether or not they actually contain, uh, whether or not they actually contain burials. Um, so because of that law, all mounds are subject to, I believe it's called the Human Skeletal Remains Protection Act. Not a great name for the act, but it's what we have to work with. Uh, so I would first reach out to Don Cobb um, at the Illinois DNR, who's the uh, archaeologist for the DNR, and uh, she can at least advise you from a, a legal perspective. Um, in terms of a cultural perspective, of course, you know, I, I, again, I would first recommend reaching out to your local tribes. Thanks, Jim, for that, and I, thank you for telling me about that that uh, law in Illinois, I had no idea. We have um, practice, you know, our laws here in California um, really do not protect our burial sites in the same manner. And they, um, we do have some laws where we're able to speak uh, before development happens if we know of a sacred site being there. Um, but um, oftentimes our, our uh, burial sites are still being destroyed 
because of development here. I think the land trust has um, uh, has a mound or has something um, that is important to the tribe that they should work with the tribe to just create an easement onto the land um, always. Um, you know, that that it's like who who can own someone else's sacred site? I mean, that's really what it comes down to is when we're in 2021, I think we have to morally look at that. Um, how is that even possible? And so um, it's good to have good relationships between tribes and and uh, land trust because sometimes the tribes are small and they can't actually take care of the larger piece of land that um, that is needed to be taken care of, but need to have access to their ceremonial places again. And that's a great relationship to have between tribes and tribal people and, and land trusts. Thanks, Karina. I think we're running out of time here, but just really quick. Um, check out your chat, everyone. Jillian put a resource in here. Um, great resources from groups working towards land trust, uh, land justice around the country. Um, Jim, thanks. Put in the IDNR's um, uh, contact, which he mentioned. Um, there's a comment from Toby. Um, new owners of the land trust now have ethical responsibility for the burials of the original people and may not know how to navigate the situation. Um, some more stuff from, let's see, uh, Jim and lots of thanks. So, um, and thanks for that. So, um, want to, uh, thank once again, Karina so much for joining us, really appreciate it and telling and sharing your story. Wonderful, wonderful. And Brooke as well. Um, really appreciate it. So, um, thank you. Um, and we have about 15 minutes left. I'm going to pass it off now to Jim, um, to wrap us up. Thanks, everyone. All right. <clears throat> thanks, Suzanne. And uh, yeah, thanks to Karina and Brooke for joining us for a great discussion on that. We really appreciate you uh, sharing your stories with us. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and <clears throat> get us moving towards um, wrapping this up. So um, let me get that. All right. So um, I want to start by once again, one last time, I should say, uh, recognizing our our sponsors for the um, for the meeting. Uh, we really appreciate their support. At the Oak Tree level, we had the Nature Conservancy, the Donnelly Foundation, Grand Victoria, and Open Lands. Thank you very much for your support. At the Oak Leaf level, we had the Heartlands Conservancy, Cardinal, Davy Resource, uh, George Covington, and the Conservation Foundation. Again, thanks for your support as well. And also for our ACORN sponsors, you can see them on the screen. We really want to appreciate their support uh, for the conference and uh, for the organization. Uh, there's a reminder, there's a conference evaluation uh, that we'd love to get your feedback on uh, how the meeting went this year. There's a link to that in the chat box. If you haven't uh, taken advantage of that, uh, there's still an opportunity for you to do so. Um, once again, I want to uh, recognize the PSCC board members that were so instrumental in pulling together what I think was a great conference. Uh, I want to recognize again Lisa, Susan, Carrie, Ryan, and Dan for their work, uh, hard work in pulling this all together. Uh, I also want to recognize Sandy, the, uh, once again, the glue that holds PSCC together uh, and who's been working uh, even while the meeting was going on, helping people get their links and just trying to keep things moving along as smoothly as possible. So thanks to Sandy. Uh, again, thanks to Jamie for her tech support and for training all of us on uh, how to do the technology that we needed and the Conservation Foundation for letting us use uh, their Zoom platform for our, uh, for our meeting. Uh, all greatly appreciated. I wanna welcome our new board members. Uh, welcome to Fran, Paul, Brooke, and Bob. Uh, we look forward to working with you as we move forward and welcome to the board. And uh, a big thanks to our retiring board members, to Lisa, Dan, and Deanna. Uh, again, I mentioned her, Lisa was instrumental in putting together um, this year's conference, really did the uh, heavy lifting on putting a lot of it together. Uh, so we wish her well as she, as she moves on. Dan, our current treasurer, has been uh, served two terms with the organization and we thank him for uh, both his service to the board and for acting as uh, treasurer. 
and also to Deanna for her contributions to the organization. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, her help as well. Uh, so I'm here is the date that we've got right now for the 2021 PSCC annual meeting. Uh, I've got tentative here. We, we actually booked this a year ago when we were at uh, Starved Rock uh, last year, uh, but we've got March 10th and 11th booked uh, for our next annual meeting. We've, as I just said, we've got it uh, booked at Starved Rock Lodge right now. I think um, the success, I'll say, of, of this meeting, some of the discussion that's been going on, uh, you know, is there possibly a hybrid or, you know, I think there's a Lots of people, great interest, I'll say, in, in meeting in person again, and hopefully, certainly by then, uh, we'll be able to do so. But uh, the online opportunities, I think, brought uh, people in. I'm sure might have been challenging to get Karina here, for example, uh, if we were in person. And so it creates a lot of opportunities as well. So the board will continue to have that discussion about um, what next what next year looks like. For the time being, please uh, save March 10 and 11 as the tentative dates for and that's 2022 jim oh, well, just as you. a reminder <laughs> yes I'm that's all right time. that's all right good catch sandy thank you all right so that's well yeah I would... 2022 obviously uh good catch um all right and then uh so then i want to thank everybody for their participation in this year's conference thanks for your support of the coalition and i think most importantly uh, thank you all for the work that you do to fulfill the promise that our wild places and open spaces will be preserved for generations to come. I hope 2021 is a great year for you, and I hope that we're back to normal as soon as we can be. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, be safe, be well, and uh, continue on the great work that you all do. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I just want to remind you that, uh, you know, this is a coalition of you, our member land trusts, and we're here to serve those, your, you, our members. And if there's things that you would like to see us do, if there's ways you think that we can serve you better, please reach out to us and let us know uh, what that is. And uh, in the meantime, we'll continue to push on. We'll keep you uh, up to date on where things go with our business plan and uh, the efforts that we talked about on the first day here to try and move the organization towards having a uh, executive director in the future. So there'll be um, lots, I think, to come. And uh, once again, thanks for all that you do for us. Mm -hmm.